Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon uh, or morning, depending on where you are. It's It's been a fantastic uh, series of events that we are now uh, curating with Deloitte's here. This is the second in uh, three installments. Uh, I hope you joined us in the first one because that was the basics of it all, where we were talking about family governance and constitution. Uh, the video is available on our website in case you need to have a look at it. Um, so yeah, please have a look at it. And really it, it's important because it all steps on top of each other. It, you, you need to be able to understand the basics of it there. And then we can now start talking today about business succession and asset preservation. So before we go into those presentations, I first, first and foremost definitely like to thank all of you to, for joining us. We have uh, more than 300 of you registered for this. Um, so it, we've been really overwhelmed and uh, heartened by the response that we've received, uh, both on behalf of Labon IBFC and Deloitte Private, we'd like to thank you. Um, and of course, we'd like to thank our partners in Deloitte Private for agreeing to, to host this together with us. Um, it's been an exciting journey for us in the wealth management industry for Labon IBFC, especially over the last 10 years, since, especially since the launch of our Foundations Act. That's really put us uh, front and center of the Asian wealth management industry because we are after all the only jurisdiction in Asia that has private foundations. So it's, it's, it's extremely exciting for us to see the growth in the last 10 years. Uh, we're home to more than almost 300 foundations now, uh, like uh, registered foundations. Less of course of those are operating because it does take some time. It's, uh, it's not a cookie cutter solution by any extension of the imagination. So I'd like to now introduce uh, and welcome Eileen to talk us through uh, some of her points with regards to business succession and asset preservation. Eileen is uh, no stranger to any of us. And uh, thank you, Eileen, for joining us. She's Director of Family Enterprise at Deloitte's Consulting, Malaysia. Uh, take it away, Eileen. Thank you. It's lovely to be here again um, for the second session. Um, as mentioned at the last webinar, uh, I talked about how we are seeing a very strong uptick, right? Uh, in business owning families using Labuan Foundations as part of their long term uh, succession planning strategy, and also about how important family governance is um, for families who own family businesses and uh, family offices, and how you know that needs to be incorporated into uh, any structure that is being a long term structure in particular, where you're locking up um, the shares of uh, family businesses. So today, we're going to talk, touch a little bit more on how um, business-owning families can further ring fence yeah, their assets to achieve even more asset protection, um, depending on their needs, okay, by using the Labuan Protected Cell Company, all right, uh, and how they can use that in, in their planning. So in the last webinar, this picture should look familiar for those of you attended, but I'm just, I need to mention it again because... Um, today, we're talking about asset preservation, which is, of course, a big part of, of the planning that families do. But, you know, um, there are a lot more wealth destroyers now in, in this uh, post-pandemic world. I wouldn't say post, we're still in it, right? Uh, Hyper-vocal world, hyper-volatile, uncertain, complicated, and, um, and uh, ambiguous, right? And the health crisis, together with the economic crisis and the social and mental health crisis that has resulted. So, so many more wealth destroyers. So number one, uh, as always, is the death, right? Deaths by in the family, unfortunately, or in, uh, in the staff, uh, loss of a founder or key man, um, it can be a real impact, yeah? A negative impact on the business um, and, and destroy a lot of value. In Malaysia, it's not too much to worry about estate tax, yeah? Um, but it will be more the large inheritance taxes if the deceased own lots of assets uh, overseas, especially in high tax jurisdictions like the US, the UK, Europe, et cetera, et cetera, or the huge capital gains tax that will accrue when uh, if they own assets in Australia and Canada where the estate tax almost operate like the, uh, I mean, the capital gains tax operate like estate taxes, right? Okay. Um, second huge destroyer, of course, is the you know, debt, um, the default of debt as a result of the pandemic. So, um, you know, you have the distinct possibility of bankruptcy and creditors, right? And then, and not only that, possibly some family businesses are also failing to meet certain uh, covenants within their loan agreements and therefore triggering, um, you know, loan callbacks and, and so having a liquidity crunch. And so when that happens, 
you have a huge issue in your business. Um, how does the family dis pivot? How do they adapt the strategy? And that can cause a lot of disputes within the family, um, unfortunately, and resulting in pos not only the disputes that creates disharmony, but also possibly more divorces, right? And in Asia, Southeast Asia in particular, we know that divorce is actually the largest destroyer of wealth, not estate taxes, right? As we mentioned, estate tax is not an issue, but because with a uh, dissolution of a marriage, unfortunately, up to 50% or possibly even more, um, could walk out the door, right? Um, Post-divorce. Then there are other non-pandemic asset destroyers like, um, you know, dissipators here, like the Paris Hilton type, you know? Uh, some of the next gen may be, you know, um, they need to protect, you need to help protect them against themselves in the future by distributing money to them slowly rather than giving it to them in one lump sum by a will, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, right? Um, there's also the need for protection against higher taxes if you leave the country um, or move, leave uh, Malaysia, um, which is quite, has quite a benign tax environment, to go to a high tax jurisdiction, yeah? Um, if planning is permissible, by that jurisdiction, then the planning needs to be done in advance, right? That is to protect the family wealth. Otherwise, you go to these higher tax jurisdictions, there is worldwide tax, yeah? Um, and then also, if you exit, some of your clients um, are exiting certain countries, moving to others, and when they exit, there could be exit taxes as well. So there's a need to plan there, right? Um, vulnerability due to aging and uh, disability and dementia and Alzheimer. We all know that there's a lot um, um, higher incidence now with longer life expectancies. And we all know of nightmare stories, right? Of where elderly vulnerable people have been um, sort of like um, unduly influenced into giving away some of the assets to possibly maids, construction workers, people who worm their way into their hearts and into their wills. Right? There's nothing wrong with giving to um, all these uh, maids and construction workers, but was that the original intention? That's the main thing. Okay, How do you protect vulnerable uh, people um, uh, who are elderly and um, with disability? Right, So it's even more important that you have a trustee or a foundation council there to guard, help guard them um, against such undue influence. Next slide, please. So advanced planning is really critical, right? Really, really, really critical. Because honestly, we always say, by the time you hear the thunder, it is far too late to build the ark. We all know Noah. I mean, you know, if you believe in this, uh, Noah built the ark when the sun was shining. No, no storm clouds. Nobody, when he said, I'm going to build this ark because the storm is coming, everyone laughed at him. But in the end, you know, the ark saved his family uh, and, and himself. So... Again, we like to use this principle um, about for families to protect their wealth, whether it's a family office or a family business, you need to protect it in advance. Yeah, uh, And particularly, it is critical for asset preservation against creditors and divorce due to a lot of anti-avoidance provisions. Next slide, please. So um, this is not going to be a bankruptcy talk, but we do need to touch on these aspects, yeah, because there are clawbacks. And um, in Malaysia, it is the Insolvency Act, uh, Section 52 of the Insolvency Act, um, where it is very clear that if you set up a trust or a foundation um, or any sort of settlement um, by, by just gifting the assets away, um, and you become bankrupt within two years, yeah, of the settlement, that transfer will be void. Basically, it'll be clawed back um, and become available uh, for attachment by creditors. And if you become bankrupt uh, five years, with if you set up the structure within five years of uh, becoming bankrupt, yeah, um, and it will also become void unless you can show that um, at the time when you set up, you were still solvent, still able to pay off all your debts, okay? And you can see here, there are some, um, so the two-year and a five-year thing is important to remember because that applies to um, you know, um, individuals who are looking to transfer assets away. So it shows that you need to plan in advance. Yeah, Plan in advance when the sky is blue, the clouds are white and puffy, the sun is shining bright, brightly. Yeah, okay. Um, so because if you set up a trust to 
or foundation, um, when the storm clouds are here um, and the lightning is striking all over the place, uh, it may be too late. It may be too late, yeah? All right, so you, uh, so you can see some of the other definitions here, but I don't think it's very important uh, right now. You can look at it, uh, read it in the um, act itself. Next slide, please. So again, you know, for so these commonly used asset preservation tools, yeah, um, companies is one. Some people use companies because it is a separate legal entity, right? You put the assets away from yourself. It's no longer yours. Um, it belongs to the company. And the debt of the company is the debt of the company. It's not the debt of the shareholder, right? Unless the corporate veil can be pierced, um, by fraud, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, where it can be shown that the primary driver is probably possibly the sole shareholder, all right? But lifting the corporate veil is not easy. But bear in mind, again, the ownership of the shares, yeah, unless the sh company shares are held in another structure, they are still owned by uh, the individual, some individual, right? And that um, would come within the Insolvency Act when the need arises. So therefore, people will say, oh, yeah, okay, then I know I, I can put it into a trust, a, like a Laban found, uh, trust or Laban foundation, or I can, um, you know, use insurance policies. But take note, I mean, we all know that there are anti-avoidance um, provisions put into place for all these various types of commonly as, um, used asset preservation tools. For the Labuan Trust, there is the Section 11 of the Labuan Trust. Uh, for Labuan Foundations, there's Section 58 of the Labuan Foundations Act. Um, and for the insurance policies, there's Section 166 uh, of the Malaysia Insurance Act, right? Basically, they all say if, you know, uh, they were set up with the intention of defrauding creditors, uh, you know, there will be... Um, a clawback, it will be voided, et cetera, et cetera. And the timing depends on the legislation. More, every country has this, right? Um, where, because no trust or foundation, you know, will be allowed to be set up with the actual intention of defrauding known creditors, all right? The, the rule of thumb is just make sure you're solvent at the time that you it is set up, yeah? And set it up early because some of them have absolute clawbacks. Like if you... Even if you're solvent, but you became bankrupt within two years um, of setting up the, the, the structure, it will be voided, okay, and clawed back. So set it up early, early, when things are good, yeah, that, then there is not, nothing to prevent people from planning. Now, for insurance, there's also one more thing. Um, uh, if un un Unwittingly, if you have uh, actually set up a statutory trust using an insurance policy where it's irrevocable and the beneficiaries are only your spouse and kids, you have actually set up a statutory trust and that is irrevocable, yeah? Um, so even if there is a divorce, um, you cannot change the beneficiaries, yeah? Unless the beneficiary agrees to, and most likely they won't, right? Yeah, so um, um, bear that in mind. In Malaysia, this... Act, um, this provision still stands uh, uh, in Singapore no longer. All right. And in terms of prenup, some people, a lot of families increasingly, especially high net worth um, families, are looking to prenups or postnups as an asset preservation tool as well. I know it's not romantic. It's horrible. It's like you're thinking of the possibility of an end even when you start, yeah, even before you start. But, um, well, if you think of a holistic risk management plan, I think uh, for high net worth individuals, unfortunately, it is an important part of the risk um, management process, right? Looking at prenups, looking at postnups. Now, we all know that they're not legally enforceable in Singapore or Malaysia, but they do, um, they can be uh, held persuasive in court, all right? Um, and typically, um, you know, it needs to be properly drafted. It needs to be, um, you know, both sides need to have proper independent legal advice, not the same um, legal advisor for both parties. They should have separate ones. You know, there needs to be full and uh, full disclosure, no um, pressure, you know, again, done early, not like the night before the wedding, those sort of things, you know. And um, a recent case, um, in Singapore that just was announced um, this week actually, where uh, um, the judge actually was, gave credibility to a prenup um, 
no, actually they did not. They did not give too much credibility on it because it depended on whether the parties actually lived according to what they had intended. All right. Um, again, it depends on the facts of the case because nothing um, like a prenup or a postnup cannot fetter the discretion of the court, right? They will always do what they need to do to be um, to achieve a just and equitable purpose for the parties. But just bear in mind, yeah, um, these are the commonly asset used asset preservation tools, but there are limitations. Okay, next slide, please. So we want to focus now on one type of asset preservation strategy that um, some families use, okay, but it's an informal one, informal um, um, a process that they use now to, to keep the parties happy, yeah, to keep the family members happy. And so some of them set up trusts and foundations, but they, they may have family members who have distinctly very different risk profiles. So take, for example, here, if there's a foundation here with a, a sub-account one, they create sub-account one for, brother, for the brother and maybe a sub-account two for the sister. Um, these are the two beneficiaries of the trust, let's say, of the foundation, sorry. Um, but they have... The brother and the sister have very different risk profiles, very different different uh, investment objectives. Let's say the brother is, you know, very into AI, very into IT, and he loves cryptocurrency investments. Yeah, he's very comfortable with that. Whereas the sister feels that's totally high risk. Um, you know, these digital assets, uh, not only cryptos. He's very into NF, uh, you know, non fungible um tokens, and the sister's like, what is that? That's not right. I want blue chip shares, uh, you know, blue chip securities. So the, the issue is, um, so some trustees or foundations actually allow them administratively to create these sub-accounts. Now, actually those pools don't belong to them, right? Yeah, unless it is a fixed trust or fixed interest trust. Um, usually it's a discretionary trust and in same uh, for a foundation. But if the settlor uh, or founder agrees, I know that it happens in practice, okay? So that the brother is able to manage his sub account, the sister is able to manage her sub account, and, you know, um, they are both happy. But legally, are they, are they really ring-fenced? You know, the idea is if the, the sister is thinking, if I do this and brother, um, you know, if he loses everything, yeah, um, and because uh, it blows up the the cryptocurrency exchange just goes down the tubes, yeah? Um, or, you know, the wallet is a warm wallet, it's not put into a cold wallet or he loses the, the, the code to it. You know, that's it, right? So the, the issue is she thinks by doing that, keeping it segregated, I can protect my own assets. But legally, actually, this is not a legal ring fencing. At the end of the day, it's still one foundation pool, um, you know, uh, she will be impacted. So, um, so therefore, one way to actually um, legally do this is, next slide please, the use of the loved one protected cell uh, company, all right? And I don't know how many of you are aware of this. Um, uh, it is a company that, uh, that is actually has cells in it, okay? So um, it starts with the lab, um, it is governed by the Labuan Companies Act of 1990, all right? So it's not a new thing. Um, uh, it's been around for a while, but it was primarily set up uh, catering for self-insuring organizations, especially captive insurers, okay? And, it's, and Labuan is now the second largest captive hub in Southeast Asia. And it's, the PCC is also very popular in the fund management industry because that was what it was, you know, it's, it's catered for. The cells are, you can have the PCC is the core, the umbrella, and then there are uh, sub funds in the different cells. All right. So basically, but the PCC is the entire legal entity. All right. It is one legal entity in itself together with all the cells. All right. Uh, the, and, um, but yet each cell is able to operate independently. It's kind of like almost having your cake and eat it, you know. You have the benefit of the entire structure being treated as one company, as one tech, uh, single entity for tax purposes or some compliance issues, but yet each cell can be operated independently and each cell, most importantly, is segregated. So if you have a brother here and a sister here, 
yeah, legally, it, they will achieve ring fencing of their assets. If the brother loses everything, the sister's um, assets will totally be protected. He can liquidate his portfolio and not have it anymore and hers will be totally kept ring fenced and safe. Okay, bankruptcy remote. Um, and there's an unlimited number of cells. So this, uh, this can work and have appeal for families that have many different, um, not just different um, siblings with different um, investment profiles or objectives, but it also appeals to families who, who may be very large families with different branches already. You know, uh, branch A, bro where brother is the head and he's got his family. Um, brothers B, sister C, sister D, you know, they can all have their own cells with their own preferences or they can have different investment types. All right. So next slide, please. So typically what we have, um, uh, what can happen and um, is that you can, because of the PCC is a company, the company itself uh, has shares. Yeah? And so you want to also take care of the um, succession of those shares. So you put those shares into, I, into a, a Labuan Foundation, for example, right? All right. And then um, you can have the control, the governance at the Labuan Foundation level in the charter and articles, as we talked about in the first webinar, and also have a level of governance at the PCC level about how decisions are made um, in the different cells. All right. So basically, um, it can be done like that. The different cells can be segregated by investment types or investment objectives, and therefore you can get peace of mind, better risk management. Okay. So each family branch can have peace of mind that their assets are completely safe. And the important thing is there are actually significant cost efficiencies. It looks like, oh, wow, you know, so complicated to set up. Is it going to be expensive? Well, um, there are cost efficiencies because you don't have to, you know, actually set up separate trusts or separate foundations. Actually, to effectively legally ring fence uh, brothers and sisters' portfolios, um, they do should set up separate legal entities. But by doing it this way, they can manage it together. Yeah, but you, um, and you have one setup, okay? Each cell can be managed um, by different people or by the same fund manager, it depends, with just a different investment mandate, all right? And yet, so, and the cells can be managed centrally at the core with only one board of directors, yeah? Um, and economic substance requirements are imposed at the core, all right? My colleague, um, Pepe, will be talking more about that, not at the individual cell level. So you actually can achieve um, control and risk management and ring fencing within one uh, legal entity, all right? And very importantly, I think not to forget that if, if you use a Laban Foundation with a PCC, both structures are within the same jurisdiction um, governed by the same regulator. All right, next slide, please. So um, again, just to go back to talk a bit about the family governance. Family governance here, we talked about is that big umbrella. It's like the family constitution uh, where you is a, the, the code of conduct that governs the entire family. Um, the family agrees in advance some rules about how decisions are made, yeah, um, and uh, manages expectations across the generations. Uh, the important thing is, this family governance is actually co-developed by the different generations, not just top down um, put by the first generation and you know, imposed onto the second generation, but the input of the second generation is, is included so that to make sure that operationally it will work once the first generation is no longer around. I think the worst thing is, the, 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 the biggest concern is that if, the next generation and the way they think and the way they work and the way they the needs that they have, if that's not taken into account, uh, a top-down approach may not work, yeah, because they just can't work together because they were never consulted, all right? So that's why they put the big family governance uh, on top. And um, below it is where we were talking about the trust, the foundation, holding the PCC, you know, um, yeah, those are, are, are the legal ownership that is the succession of the legal ownership. 
the family governance takes care of the succession of the management and decision making. Very, very importantly. All right, next slide, please. So um, I'm coming to the end of my section already. So just to end by saying this, we have um, um, uh, a saying, Peter Drucker, yeah, uh, used to say, organizational culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? Okay, you see the Pac-Man, those of us who are in from that generation remember Pac-Man and, um, you know, uh, so the culture, organization culture will eat any strategy anytime. Meaning that any strategic plan in an organization is only as good as the people who implement it and, are, and is only as good um, and will only be as effective if the people who implement it share the same culture, share the same view, share the same mission and um, share the same objectives. Yeah. So there must be a glue that keeps the people together. If there isn't, no matter how beautiful your strategic plan is, it's not going to fail because the people who implement it will have all kinds of resistance. And it's the same in the family. Yeah? Family culture trumps law every time. It trumps the legal structures that are put in place. So unless the, the because the legal structures like the trust foundation, family office, shareholder agreement are all legal structures that take care of the succession of um, legal ownership. That is the shell, yeah? You need the heart and soul to operationalize your trust and foundation or family office, right? And that is the culture of the uh, family. Culture of the family, values of the family. Is the family aligned? Is, are their expectations aligned? Um, are they, um, are they, uh, is their culture, are they in sync with each other? Or are they going to quarrel over every single decision that they have to make together, particularly when the first generation or earlier generation is no longer around, okay? Because remember, as families grow, they become more, more family members. They can be spread out around the world, right? Grow up in different cultures, uh, more, some more westernized. Uh, even if, you're, if you grew up in the same place like Malaysia, you may send your family members to the States, to, the, to Australia, to the UK, they study there, they come back or they do their university there, uh, postgraduate, and then they come back with very, very different worldview from what um, the first generation may have. And then that can be a culture clash. So there, that, therein lies the difference. You need to align the expectation in advance. So from our perspective, and from our experience, the best asset preservation strategy for wealth owning families, for business owning families, for family office owning families is to have effective family governance set up early in advance, right? Again, by the time you hear the thunder, it is too late to build up. So what we want to do is help you build the up um, when everything is good and shine and, and the family is in harmony um, ahead of disputes when they're still talking to each other to in order to maintain that um, um, uh, harmony to have a well every family will, will quarrel right we're not saying that if you have a family constitution your family will never quarrel no such thing okay as long as you have two people and two heads and two brains they will always have a disagreement but the important thing is to um, institute a conflict um, resolution mechanism in there when there's disagreements and also have rules about how, uh, what is expected about behavior, okay? So um, with that, um, next slide, please. I think I've come to the end. Um, I just wanted to leave you all with some questions to ponder, right? For those of us uh, here who are listening, who actually have, uh, you know, wealth, a lot of wealth to worry about, family business, some of these questions you might want to go back and think about. Now, um, like one, is our family aligned regarding who can work in the family business? Yeah. Example, can spouses work? Are they, um, is a family uh, aligned on what is the qualifying criteria for people to work? What about adopted children? What about stepkids? Yeah. Um, are they allowed to? Are they allowed to sit on the board 
on the family board? Are they allowed to have a say in the decision making? Um, do we know whether the next generation is able to work together harmoniously? Yeah, or relatively harmoniously um, to make decisions, okay, regarding the family business or your wealth. Do we know whether the next generation really aspires to work in the family business? Or do they actually prefer to chart their own course? Or are they working in the business because they're forced to? They're expected to? Are they going to be happy that way? Is it sustainable? Yeah, when uh, the first generation is no longer there, will they just decide, okay, this is time to get out then, you know? Um, or do you think the next generation just wants to retain control of the business within the family, but actually not work at the operational level? So they just want to be on the board of directors. If that's the case, then how is the family? Is the family aligned about how you're going to choose who to sit on the board of directors? Yeah, many, many family businesses disputes start at this level also. Very serious. This is a very serious uh, quarrel. Okay, um, Are they likely to agree? Uh, with each other, or are they likely to quarrel? Okay, uh, maybe second generation, you know who 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 is qualified. But what about the third generation and the fourth generation? Who can come up to sit on the family board? Yeah. So I think the important thing is, you know, um, the to ask yourself: Are you concerned? Are you concerned that family members will depend too much on the family business to support their lifestyle, but possibly not? contribute to growing the business or growing the family wealth for future generations, right? You know, that means take, two, take, take, take without contributing to growing it because you want to keep, you need to keep growing the family pot um, if you want the legacy to continue. If you want your hard-earned and hard-built empire or a leg, uh, family business to last uh, uh, three generations, four generations, five generations, right? Yeah. So by doing... Um, family constitutions and family governance, um, we are raising the likelihood that you will. Okay, so um, these are just some questions I'd like to leave with you. And now I will end and hand over the session to my dear esteemed colleague, Pepe. Thanks, Elaine. Okay, well, um, so much about family governance. Um, okay. What I'm going to discuss and share with you throughout this session, uh, it's basically uh, some of the uh, pertinent changes but with respect to the tax regime uh, in Lab 1, all right? Uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot about Lab 1 substance requirement. What, what is this substance requirement? Who does it apply on? And why in the first place do we have so much changes, all right? Um, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, before you go on into these slides, allow me to share a little bit. Uh, this is what has been happening over the past few years. As you know, there has been significant changes to the global tax landscape because jurisdiction complies with international standards in order to reduce the tax leakages, right? And especially standards imposed by the OECD and also the European Union's conduct of uh, Code of Conduct group uh, business taxation. So Malaysia has uh, committed to be a member to the OECD inclusive framework on BAPS base erosion profit shifting. And henceforth, um, what Malaysia is required to do is it has to comply with some of the minimum prescribed BAPS standards, especially those under the BAPS Action 5. Uh, what is BAPS Action 5? It's basically which focuses on harmful tax practices. All right. Now, apart from the OECD inclusive framework, you also have the EU uh, uh, conduct of uh, business, which has already been also established by the EU Council to curb harmful tax competition. So what has happened is that uh, these are commitments introduced in those countries and whichever countries that do not commit and do not uh, 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 comply with those uh, 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 preferential uh, conditions. The EU COGC concerns will then, they will include those countries as in the list of non-cooperative jurisdiction, or in a sense, you will be blacklisted. So along with this backdrop, the, 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 the OECD and Malaysia being part of the member of the uh, inclusive framework, and also the EU COCG, the economic substance requirements were then introduced with effect from 1st January 2019. And by extension, Malaysia uh, 
is considered to have complied with those international standards, right? So what has happened is that it is a good move because it, it, it shows an attractive consideration you know, to investors within around the world. And also at the same time, we do have relevant authorities in enhancing the position, as you can, uh, uh, you, you can understand, we do have what you call a Lab 1 IBFC's position, uh, uh, sorry, the, the Lab 1 Investment Committee, LIC. And this LIC comprises of the Ministry of Finance, the Indian Revenue, right, and the Lab 1 uh, FSA, which was formed to establish and monitor and improve uh, substance requirement in Lab 1, right? So what has happened here is that because of this backdrop and because of these reasons, right, there are quite a fair bit of changes. Um, firstly, the 20,000 tax is abolished, all right? So in Lab 1 now, if you're carrying out a trading activity, you will be taxed at 3% on net profit, right? And income from intellectual property are no longer taxed under the Lobata. It will be taxed under the Income Tax Act at 24%, all right? And there is no restriction dealing with Malaysian, uh, uh, no restriction on dealings with Malaysian ringgit or Malaysian resident. Um, moving forward, um, it, it, it can be dealt with freely with Malaysian and in Malaysian ringgit. But what has happened is that any company that has dealings with Lab 1 entities, there are restrictions on tax deduction for certain types of payment. Uh, payments for, for, for lease payment, interest payment, and other payments, all right? I shall not go in greater detail for those deductibility, but these are the changes. But most importantly, you will see in the next slide is talking about the new economic substance requirement. Can I have the next slide? This new economic substance requirement was made effective 1st January 2019. And under this new substance requirement is that any Lab 1 entity moving forward, right, will need to comply with two conditions. One is you must have adequate full-time employees in Lab 1, and you must have an adequate amount of annual operating expenditure in Lab 1. Now, this condition uh, must be fulfilled, and this is the, the beauty is that this is something that has already been gazetted, right? Uh, and, and they have also been revised uh, PU order in 2020, um, which gives certainty and clarity to companies that have businesses in Lab 1. So certain companies like captive insurance, the banks or other business activities, the, the number of full-time employees will be different. The number of operating expenditure will be different. Right now, gone are the days where an, uh, uh, someone can basically set up an entity in Lab One and take advantage of the preferential tax rate in Lab One. You must have substance, substantive uh, substance requirement based on the different types of business activity in Lab One. Now, the penalty for not complying with those substance requirement is that if any of the entity fail to comply with the requirement, it will be subject to tax at twenty percent of the net profits, all right? Um, this is a very heavy uh, 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 penalty, I would say, but it gives awareness to people that, look, if you are serious in investing, you're serious in having an entity in Lab 1, it's only fair that that would require, to a certain extent, some kind of substance requirement, all right? The next slide, please. Now, let's go on into greater detail. What are these substance requirements that we're talking about? They are generally, um, uh, um, I think, 22 items, all right? 22 different categories of a business uh, Lab 1 uh, entity in the regulations. The first one, it was first introduced via the Lab 1 Business Activity Tax Regulations 2018, and it was subsequently revised uh, with certain changes. But what I want to um, uh, uh, highlight today is uh, we are talking about wealth, uh, family governance, and I'm going to pay particular attention in terms of Lab 1 entity that is carrying on an investment holding activities, basically an investment holding company, all right? So as you can see here that if you have a Lab 1 entity that undertakes pure investment holding activities, right? Uh, you can invest in shares, you can invest in commodities, securities, and all those stuff. The substance requirement is that that entity must have at least one full-time employee in Lab 1, and you must have a minimum annual operating expenditure of 20000 
On the other side, if it is a pure entity, equity holding uh, uh, activities, meaning you set up a lab one foundation or a lab one company that only holds shares beneath it, all right? So what the lab, lab one entity will get is probably just dividends. So if it is purely an entity that only undertakes pure equity holding, you do not need to have a full-time employee in lab one, although you still need to maintain 20,000 ringgit as annual operating expenditure in lab one. Now, in addition to that, right, uh, can I have the next slide? You also need to pay attention that in the context of a pure equity holding, right, um, you also must make sure that the, there must be management and control requirement shown in the pure equity holding entity, meaning that you must incur 20,000 and you must basically fly over to Lab 1 to carry out the management and control the board meeting. Now, during the COVID uh, pandemic situation, uh, we do know that um, the authorities has given relaxation. You can actually have a virtual meeting carried out uh, during this period. So what has happened is there are relaxation um, for lab one entity that carry out pure equity holding activity. On the other flip side, non-pure equity holding, um, well, you need to have a step up and a more slightly more enhanced requirement that is you must have at least one full-time employee, all right? So what do you mean by holding company that can be, you know, what, how do you define investment holding company? The definition of the holding company is actually based on the OECD uh, definition under the BEPS Action 5, which, which means to explain that a holding company is broadly divided into two categories. Firstly, you hold a variety of assets and earn different types of income. You can earn interest income, you can have rental, you can have royalties. These will be um, non-pure equity holding investment companies, right? But for those that purely hold equity, you will, you will then say that you only earn dividend and capital gains. Now, we have also known that in some of the uh, LIC commentaries, we do see that they are relaxation in a situation that when a lab one entity were to receive dividends and in the course of receiving the dividends, right, you place the money to earn interest income. The authorities has also clarified that it will still be considered as a pure equity holding because you only meant to have that lab one entity to hold shares, nothing more but shares, all right? So there are actually two vast distinct requirements, all right, which everyone would need to take, uh, um, be aware of. So what you have here is a summary of what are the requirements as far as investment holding entity are concerned. Can I have the next slide? I've shown here a, a, a quick comparison. If it is a lab one foundation or it can be a lab one company for the matter, if you are having a holding entity that undertakes pure equity holding, you do not need anybody to be in lab one. The one-time full one, one uh, full-time employee is not a requirement. You just have to make sure that the management and control is demonstrated that is carried out in Lab One. You fly over to Lab One to have the board meeting and twenty thousand uh, operating expenditure. On the left hand side, if you do have much more uh, investment passive activities, like you may have uh, investments in, in, in securities, right, and other types of instruments, then you need to have one time. So you bear in mind, uh, what is very important here is that uh, based on experience, we do see that uh, uh, our clients are aware of the substance requirement. But if you are, you are not up to date, and you notice that maybe perhaps you have an entity that was initially set up as a pure equity holding. And throughout the months and years, you wanted to invest and include additional investment activities. So say I may want to hold bonds or securities, then ultimately you, you will step into the non-pure equity. And once you do that, right, you have to ensure that there is one full-time employee condition to be met. Because if you do not meet any of those conditions, the penalty is going to be heavy. Now, they're going to talk about 24% tax on chargeable uh, profits. And the minute, what do you mean by chargeable profits? They didn't care what kind of profit it is. So long as they look at the audited accounts, there's a net profit and they're going to impose 24% on that. All right. I know uh, uh, some will be asking, you know, in, in, in the course of all this, uh, there are questions that talks about what happens if it is an accounting profits, what happened if it is a capital gain, notwithstanding that 
um, the law is very clear to say that if there is a chargeable profit, there will be 24%. So just make sure and be very, very clear that we do not fall into that non-compliance penalty. All right. Okay, so much about uh, substance requirement. I will now move on to another topic, which is just as important, um, which is common reporting standards in Malaysia. And I'm sure uh, most of you uh, would also have a bit of knowledge of what is CRS, right? Um, common reporting standard came about a couple of years ago, and it's also basically uh, uh, common reporting standards uh, uh, span up from the initiation of the international tax jurisdiction tax regime to improve tax transparency and also to facilitate exchange of information between participating jurisdiction. So Malaysia again has committed to the exchange of information and um, it started way back in 2018. Uh, as you can see, a lot of financial institution has already begun exchanging information. So what it entails at the end of the day is that moving forward, the Malaysian Indian Revenue Board do not need to specifically request for information of tax residents uh, who are abroad. All right. Let me give you an example. Um, say if I would have children um, residing in Singapore. All right, and the children, although they are working in Singapore, they could be Malaysian residents. The minute if they have bank accounts in Singapore, the Singapore financial institution will automatically, by virtue of the, the CRS compliance, be obligated to transmit that information to the tax authorities in Singapore. And the authorities in Singapore is going to exchange those information with the Indian Revenue Board. So you can see how powerful is this uh, common reporting standards. Uh, the next slides, please. And the, the next slides will basically give you an idea how common reporting standards or automatic exchange of information works, right? Uh, it is actually very, very powerful. Uh, as you know and recall back in 2018, 2019, Malaysia actually implemented the uh, special voluntary disclosure program because they know that a lot of information will be flowed back into Malaysia and the tax authorities actually gave a voluntary disclosure uh, uh, program to allow taxpayers to come forward and declare income which they have omitted to declare in the prior years. All right, so just to give you a snapshot, as you can see here, um, if you're looking at the reportable uh, reporting financial institutions, any banks in, in, in uh, Malaysia for that matter, so you would have non-Malaysian resident having an entity account or individual account, by virtue that they are tax resident in foreign countries, their information will be automatically exchanged, right? The information will flow to the Indian Revenue and Indian Revenue on an annual basis will exchange information on financial assets with the tax authorities which have already signed uh, the agreement with Malaysia. So this is actually very powerful. And uh, in actual fact, we do have, we do receive a lot of individuals uh, uh, coming up in the past couple of years uh, making a voluntary disclosure of the income that has not been reported. Because moving forward uh, in revenue, in fact, we received quite a fair bit of letters. The clients came in and say that, look, I received a letter from the tax authorities indicating that I have financial assets and accounts overseas, even to the extent of BVI. And how would Indian Revenue know it? I say, well, it's because of the automatic exchange of information, right? You don't have to, you, you cannot presume the tax authorities would not know such information, all right? So what has happened is that, um, again, for taxpayers, is also very important because Malaysia is on territorial scope. So your next question is that if this information is, is received by the tax authorities, how would the tax authorities assess those income? Because Malaysia is not on worldwide basis, Malaysia is on territorial scope. So what I would say is that, look, you need to be able to demonstrate that those income that Indian Revenue has knowledge about are not Malaysian source income. Do you have evidence to defend that these are foreign source income or these are income that are passed down to you by your, 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 your father? All right, so these are the things that you need to prove. So I think uh, it is very challenging for those couple of years, all right? And the Indian Revenue moving forward actually would have information of those 
uh, uh, foreign assets that the individual has outside Malaysia. Now, also to clarify, common reporting standards do not apply to real property. It would apply on financial assets, all right, on uh, the cash that you put in the bank, all right. And um, what are the other, what, what are the, how, how the, how does, other than how does common reporting standard work? Who is required to be reporting those? Can I have the next slides? You can see here that common reporting standards basically would apply to these four pillars. Firstly, the banks, because banks receive depository, uh, uh, would receive FD and cash and things that. These are places where people put money in. And these are the depository institutions that are obligated under the CRS rules to report it to the tax authorities. The second category would be custodial institution. These custodial institutions are institutions that will hold securities through nominees or custodian account. You will find that in investment banks, right? The third one will be specified insurance companies. That, that means uh, cash value insurance, all right? The, the, the one that is very, very important and is very relevant to wealth management is investment entities, right? Investment entities like even uh, unit trusts, you know, funds that are managed. And of course, when you look at the managed funds, you look at is protected cell company, uh, uh, a reportable financial institution. Well, if it meets the criteria of an investment entity, then yes, which I'm going to run through with you uh, in a short while. So these are basically the four pillars because what the authorities around the world is saying that, look, I'm going to catch people that has financial assets abroad outside from the, the country where they reside. And these are the intermediaries and these are the conduits that can help the, the tax authorities to retrieve those information and then report it. It is actually a very powerful uh, 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 system. All right, because the authorities has known that over the years, you know, the right country has not, the people hasn't been paying the right amount of taxes in their home countries. So they are actually enforcing this to allow that every country will collect the right amount of taxes. All right. So with this, um, I would also give a little bit of explanation since um, there have also been quite a fair bit of people asking about common reporting standards treatments on trust. All right. And it is very important because in the context of wealth management it is something that you need to know what are the differentiation. Can I have the next one uh, slides? All right. Now, um, I'm going to go through pretty quickly, but what you need to know is that if you have trust or even Lab One Foundation, how common reporting standards would uh, would apply is there are two different categories. There are categories where a trust is treated as a reportable financial institution. How it will be treated as a reportable financial institution, it is when the trust is professionally managed, either by a fund manager, the fund manager, which is basically, you know, who is attached with a financial institution, all right? And if it is not a, a, a trust that is professionally managed, you can end up having what you call a passive non-financial entity. All right. If, it, if a trust is a passive NFE, what will happen is that the trust itself will not be required to do the CRS reporting, but instead, the banks, the financial institution will be obligated to do the reporting. So they will report whatever banking, uh, financial uh, banking accounts to the tax authorities. All right. So who are who, who will be the account holders and all those things? If you look into the next slides here, all right. Um, I will not go through the detail, the steps of what do they need to do, but as far as if it is a trust at a reportable financial institution, they will then have to be reporting the controlling person, the settler, the beneficiary, or any natural person exercising ultimate control of the trust. And what is going to be reported is the total value of all the trust properties. If you look into the context that where if it is a trust, which is a passive NFE, what the bank will report is only to the extent of the amount of balance or the value of the movement in the account that is kept with the bank. So one is the trust itself would have to report as a reportable financial institution. The other one is that the, the financial institution will have to report financial accounts of the passive NFE. All right. So I think with that, uh, my last slide would be uh, a quick 
recap on what will happen in the context of a PCC, right? I think the beauty of the PCC here is that although your PCC would have many sub-cell, right? A PCC will be considered as an investment fund. Whether it is a reportable FI or a passive NFE would depend on who are the fund managers. Is it a professional fund managers, right? If it is professional attached with an FI, then the PCC itself will be a reportable uh, investment entity, right? Now, what will happen here is that in the context of a bank, if the PCC is a non-NFE, the bank will see through and look at who is the ultimate beneficial owner to find out who is the controlling person. Because sometimes when you have structures within layers and layers and held by corporate entity, under the common reporting standards, the bank is required to see through the will of the corporate entity and find out who is the ultimate controlling person. So it is actually very powerful because gone are the days where a lot of people will have many, many layers to hide who is the ultimate holder. With the common reporting standard, they are required to disclose who is the ultimate controlling person and report to the country where he resides. So I think in the nutshell, um, I have completed the uh, session. I, uh, we shall be uh, able to take on any questions. We actually have some questions. I think a lot of people appreciated very much your presentation, Pepe. Uh, Thank you. Because the, yeah, because it was very clear and it, it set out really the, the parameters, the requirements uh, of uh, taxation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, wealth management structures. We actually have a couple of questions here. I think we should overrun. So just have a very quick quest, uh, discussion in the next five minutes. The first question is, can a Labuan Foundation hold a licensed entity in Labuan? Uh, yes, there's no limitation with regards to what a Labuan Foundation can hold. Uh, but obviously for certain items, uh, especially with regards to Malaysian uh, assets, there has to be requirements, domestic Malaysian assets, there has to be requirements from uh, the competent authority or a certain office that allows for that transfer of equity, if I am correct. Um, Next question, actually, Pepe, how does how will the Laban Foundation be taxed? Mm. I think this is what you you answered earlier, and specifically if it does not fall within the PU nine three nine two. Okay, this is actually very very interesting, and whoever asks this question, I would I would say kudos because you're very sharp in 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 identifying and noticing that right in the first PU order twenty eighteen, you would note that in item twenty one, right. The definition of a lab one entity, it says investment holding company. So when we look at that, we say, hey, lab one foundation is not a company. So it right. actually doesn't come into play. So there was a lot of debate, a lot of discussion, even with the LIC. And subsequent to that, right, you will see that there is a subsequent PUA yeah. uh, that was issued in 2020. And they changed the name from investment holding company to investment holding entity. entity right so when you talk about entity in the definition of lobata the lab one entity is is based on uh, a schedule in the lobata and lab one foundation is considered a lab one entity so now it fits back into the category of investment holding entity so you notice that they don't call it company anymore they call it a lab one holding entity all right. Now, because Lab One Foundation are usually used for wealth management purposes, you hold investment and stuff like that. A very core important thing to note is, is it a pure holding entity or a non-pure holding entity? And it goes back to that loop that I've just mentioned. All right. So there isn't very far, there isn't very much to hide, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's not even try and go there. Uh, does, <laughs> does a resident secretary count as a full-time employee? Unfortunately, no. Right, Pepe? I think uh, what the what 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 in the FAQ right I've mentioned is that it must be a full time employee and it must be salaries that are charged into the lab in the lab one entity. So you can have a situation where uh, uh, overseas employees who are working, uh, but the salaries are not charged back to the lab one entity. So the minute if there is no salary cost in the lab one entity, they will not acknowledge that you have met the condition. All right. But yeah. a full-time employee actually doesn't have a requirement. You must be a manager or whatever. All right. It can be any destination. It's not necessarily defined. Correct. Right? Correct. Yeah, it's not defined. And the other thing is, and I'm sure you mentioned this in the slides earlier, the requirement for operational spend is in Ringgit Malaysia. 
Yes. Uh, and this are uh, this must be expenditure spent in lab one. Eh? So if you yes. pay the trust company, right, that helps you to set up, uh, yes, it will qualify as a, a operating expenditure. But if you were to pay, say, Deloitte, and Deloitte is in Malaysia, all right, the tax fees, I'm so sorry, it won't qualify because you have to meet the condition that these are operating expenditure incurred in lab one. Well, right. I'm sorry, have, have your clients not asked you to set up an office in Lamwon then? We do uh, have, uh, sorry, we, 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 we don't have a lab office in Lamwon, but we do have a, a audit license in Lamwon, yes. right, which is different, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's one other question, uh, is dividend considered a chargeable income in Labata? Ah, okay. Uh, now, in the structure of a non-pure holding, so that means there's right. no, there's no compliance to to non-pure or there's no compliance to substance, right? Depending. Uh, you, you, you got to remember that in lab one, right? Which a lot of people has, has accidentally or conveniently used the mirror of the Malaysian Income Tax mm. Act and superimpose it into a lab one context, right? What, what, what I mean by that is that if you have a lab one foundation or any particular lab one entity, Mm. Any di dividend income that the lab one entity receives will constitute its revenue, right? And you less expenses, you wouldn't have a chargeable profits, right? So Correct. it doesn't mean that if it is a dividend income, it will not be taxable. How the lab one is taxed is that whether it is a trading activity or whether it is a non-trading activity. If it is a non-trading activity, then there's no tax. But if it is a trading activity, and then, and what do you mean by lab one trading activity? It includes banking, insurance, trading, management, licensing, or shipping operation, or any activity which is not a lab one non-activity. All right. So, firstly, I think that you must have certain license in lab one in order to carry out those activities. There is also a a, a uh, condition that uh, the relevant authorities has also mentioned, which Inland Revenue has also brought up. Well, if you do not feel, if you do not fall under the uh, 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 requirement for lab one business activity, automatically it will be taxed under the Malaysian Income Tax Act. Right now, think about it. If it is an entity that automatically falls under the uh, uh, Malaysian Income Tax Act, not by virtue of you doing a, rec uh, 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 a re re uh, revocation. If the same income is uh, taxed in the, under the Income Tax Act, remember, under the Income Tax Act, foreign source income are not taxable, mm -hmm. dividend income are not taxable. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's, 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 it's neutral. What I don't it's want- It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Correct, correct. You know what I mean? So you can, you can still use a lab one foundation or any vehicle for purposes of succession planning, for purposes yes. of family constitution, the family office, but you must be very, very careful as to meeting the substance requirement because the minute you, you do not meet the substance requirement, you will not be able to avail yourself to certain exemptions like stamp duty exemptions, withholding tax exemption, and you're going to pay tax at 24% of net profits. All right, so that is a very heavy one. So I always remind client to make sure when you do any structures, you must be very clear what are the substance requirement for you. Mm. Mm. And I think you, you, you kind of bring up indirectly a very important element that I want to put across here, right? So Lab One is not just about tax. You know, people need to understand that the structures are very unique to Lab One. And then you have an option to have a Lab One tax skin on top of this structure or a Malaysian tax scheme. And because we're territorial in regime, right? And foreign source income is not chargeable. Mm. You know, there are ways of looking at it and using the lab one structures or solutions, whether it be a licensed, non-licensed entity, you know, it's beside the point, but the lab one legal provisions to create a structure and then decide on your tax scheme. I think that's important to remember mm. when, when you start looking at planning. Uh, and, and looking at really what would suit you because we're not in this cookie cutter business. We have uh, overrun by eight minutes, ladies, um, and we haven't gone through any of the questions we prepared, which is always a very good sign. But I have a very important question to ask both of you before we leave, right? So we have tax transparency, we have ownership transparency, right? Then you have planning issues. Do you both think, and this is a question for both of you, do you think with the advent of tax transparency and ownership transparency, which we didn't actually discuss, huh? 
the beneficial owner issue, we did directly, indirectly via the CRS, but there are also beneficial registers and stuff like that to discuss. Do you think it's harder or easier to plan now? If, if I may take the cue first, right? Um, I think if you look at it um, uh, in the, in the uh, industries, right? What has happened in 30 years ago, 20 years ago, people like, you know, wealth owners like to set up complicated structures, layers and layers and layers, right? Why? Because they don't want people to know who is holding those structures, right? right? And this actually, uh, you know, created, um, uh, yeah, you may say that people doesn't know, but the question of whether there's any issue of money laundering, whether the issue of transparency. So when, when the international, uh, when the change in international tax landscape, where now it is not only driven by the Malaysian Indian Revenue Board, it's driven by worldwide, right? Mm. We don't want to be in the blacklisting, in the, in the blacklist, and we want to be a member of the uh, 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 OECD. Uh, correct. What are we going to do? And you see all this changing that basically forces everybody, look, whether you like it or not, you got to declare that is a certain amount of transparency. So gone are the days would be you will like my share or to be hold by nominee or bearer shares, that kind of thing. So you know the, the advisors will have a, a hard time figuring out who is the controlling person. All right? All right. But gone are those days where the CRS requirement pushes the financial institution and make them responsible to find out who are the controlling person. You can do a lot of layering up there. All right. Well, but towards the are, UBO, but correct, still. Correct. I, I think it takes a while because what will happen that you can imagine the first generation would like to do all this, right? With layering and layer, layering. Come the second generation, oh my God, you know, my, 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 my grandparents' layers are so complicated and they want to unwind it. Mm. How are you going to do it? To mm. me, if you are, you are transparent, you are in compliance uh, with day one, I think you will save a lot of tax costs having to incur, you know, legal and other costs to try to unwind it or, you know, a case will go to the court and stuff like that. So I think it is a balance. But of course, having said that, I do know that it's an issue of secrecy, you know, the extent of information going to the, the authority, some people well, not, not, not want. I'm, I'm sorry, maybe not secrecy, but privacy. Yeah, yeah. Privacy, I think the issue yeah, right. of privacy, you know. I mean, Eileen, so it's more altruistic now. It's really about the family, the ethos of the family, the principles, the governance, the structure. I, I agree with Pepe, definitely. I mean, in, in my view, I think it's actually easier to plan now. The mm. options are a lot less because you just don't need to consider all those weird and wonderful <laughs> uh, structures. Um, you know, we just do what is fiscally transparent. Um, actually, it's been what I have been advocating for the last 20 years, way before uh, the, the global trend towards uh, transparency. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's just, maybe it's because I have, I have, uh, uh, I have been a regulator, a bank regulator for eight years. Yeah, so I have the regulatory DNA within me, uh, the compliance aspect. So it's always been compliant, fiscally transparent planning. Um, there isn't much, there isn't much choice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it just makes things much simpler for the next generations mm. to manage, you know, um, when, when they know what it's about, but it's still important. Sometimes the next gen, uh, they don't know why it was set up. Yeah. Mm. They don't understand why it's so complicated. Like, like Pepe says, it's difficult. It actually makes things much more difficult for, for the next gen. So keep it simple. Yeah. The KISS principle <laughs> works really well. <laughs> so we need to remember the KISS principle, uh, Peter Joker and Noah. Yes. <laughs> so these are the key takeaways from this, uh, from this seminar, from this, from this webinar. I think, I think Labuan Foundation can hold Malaysian companies, right? Mm. Uh, and Malaysian and foreign investments. Uh, I think if you look at Labuan Foundation, there's no, there's no restriction for you to hold foreign entities. But what is important yes. is what is the business activity of the, the, the entity, right? Yes. And then from yes. there on, you look at what is the substance requirement. But of yeah. course, if you are doing a Labuan trading activity, then obviously you'll be taxed at 3% of that profits. Right. Yeah, exactly. So right. it really depends on what's going on inside 
before you, you know, before you decide to place it into a foundation, right? All right, All right. Yeah, exactly. So can the full-time staff with a residential address in Labuan, but most of the time not stay in Labuan, but in Kia? I think, uh, Mr. Kim, uh, this is a question you should take offline. Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think once you are resident in Labuan, anybody's going to chain you to a chain link fence in Labuan to stay in Labuan, put it that way. Uh, but yeah, you must have a residential address in Labuan in order to be seen as employed in Labuan, I right. believe, uh, under the FTE, uh, the, right. the, the FTE requirements in Malaysia, right? So Stephanie says you need to bear in mind the sensitivity of the characterization of reporting. Um, yes, uh, I guess so, but that, that will be nuanced in, in I guess, uh, the different regimes that you, you will work under, right? And all that you have to deal with. So that's it. We've answered all the questions, and um, I think we have a we've we had a fantastic time. I think we still have 150 people with us. So thank you very much for staying with us. Thank you very much, Deloitte Private, Eileen, Pepe, uh, the team at Deloitte Private. It's been a pleasure. Stay with us for the next edition, where we will be discussing uh, the Islamic aspects of wealth management. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.